You're listening to the Better Two Podcast with DM Needham. Hi gang, Donna here. Thanks for tuning in to the Better Two Podcast. Today's guest is Doug Steppleton. Doug has a very fascinating story. While he is an author of It's a Wonderful Time or co-author, he also decided when he graduated high school that he wanted to go to music school and he had two options, go to Berkeley or go to music school in Hollywood. He chose Hollywood and he has been there since. He talks about how in the 80s, he took up a position at the Beverly Hills Hotel parking cars and how that ended up being at the right place at the right time to end up growing his career and the fascinating people he met. So stay tuned. This episode of the Better Two Podcast is brought to you by Kitty Mystic and DM Needham, author of My Days with the Dark Muse, as well as Love is Worth Waiting For. In the beginning, applause was his drug of choice. He felt so loved that he couldn't help but sample the buffet of women that were presented. It didn't matter that he had a wife or a daughter. His addictions became his life. When death came knocking, reality came crashing in. He thought he wanted a new reality, but did he really? My Days with the Dark Muse by DM Needham, available at online booksellers. Hi, Doug. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks. So you have a journey of you grew up in a small town in Montana and the big lights of Hollywood kind of called to you uh yes uh but um it's important to note that i um before i came to hollywood when i was 19 when i graduated school in 18 at 18 my friends um donnie and i uh took up had planned to do a road trip after we graduated so we did a month road trip we went from montana to seattle uh spent a week there because he had an uncle Ooh, sorry about that uh had an uncle and um And then we came down the coast and then he had some cousins that lived in Oxnard, California, which was about an hour or so from Los Angeles. And so we spent a week there and then to Vegas and then back home. So I I spent a week, um, uh, but we spent a week in California. And so I got a little taste of the nice weather and uh, the beaches and stuff. So uh, when I decided to go to a music school, I had a choice to either go to Berkeley uh, my two choices were Berkeley on the on you know in Boston, uh, East Coast, uh, cold during the winter, which I know what cold winters are being in Montana. So, uh, or go to or go to Hollywood and have nice weather, and so that's why I chose Hollywood. That's one of the reasons, and I like Hollywood. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, and it's a different, it's a totally different world in Montana. That's for sure. Totally, yeah, it's a totally culture shock. Totally different, yeah. How hard? So this is the 1980s, so 1984. So how hard of a, an adjustment was it for you? Um, it, it was not really that hard because I'm, I kind of am an, an adventurous guy a little. So I was looking at it as a great adventure. Um, I, 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 I lived in an apartment about a block, a block, two block and a half off of Hollywood Boulevard. So I, when I went to the music school, I went to, it was at the time above uh, where the Hollywood wax museum is. So every day I'd walk down, uh, maybe, 10 blocks down Hollywood Boulevard every, uh, you know, five days a week, six days a week. So, um, you get, you know, you see stuff pretty quick and then it just becomes the norm. Um, so I adjusted pretty good. Um, yeah, I, I just loved it. Now, obviously you're still there, correct? Yeah. 30 some years later, 35 years later. I mean, I I've had other guests on the show that have gone to Hollywood and they're like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then, yeah, they ended up leaving. Well, it is tough. I, I think I was hearing that about every year, about 40,000 people, actors come to Hollywood every year and only about, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, you know, like 400 out of those 40,000 actually are working on a daily basis or in, you know, making a go of it. So those are pretty steep odds you know the good news is you know with the internet that we have the option now to have more projects readily noticed to find a bigger audience yes yeah back back when in 80 84 85 when i was there no internet uh, i remember i used to go to the library all the time to read books and uh check out uh 
let's see that back then it was uh, VHS tapes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, things were a lot different back then, but yeah, nowadays, boy, there's so many different opportunities in regards to yeah, getting a, a film, um, you know, exposure. Well, and also I think, you know, now if you, you, you took yourself, if you time traveled and that's kind of fitting for what you wrote. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you time traveled now with the technology that you have now to back then think of the network opportunities you would have had and how easier, you know, life would have been a little bit easier, I think. Yeah, back then, no cell phones. I think uh, I don't even know if pagers were on at the, in the eighties. Maybe, maybe pagers late. were there, but yeah, yeah, you, but you, the, yeah. Unless you were a doctor or a drug dealer, it wasn't yes. something that was very common. Yeah, it was. Um, it was a different time, but not knowing any different, right? I mean, now we know all this stuff, but back then, not knowing that there was going to be cell phones, you just—it's kind of funny. I remember when I like when you would call like a friend's house, you know, and you'd. And you would uh, call, you would have to leave a message if they're not there, have, have so-and-so call me and you'd have to wait until they get back. Yep. Or if you could, if they're not, if they're out of town, you just wouldn't know. So we're so used to instant gratification now with, with all the technology is pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, you could drive by your friend's house. If they weren't there, that was it. You weren't going to go track them down and go meet them somewhere. No. It was like, well, that's it. I guess I'm not going to hang out with them today. That's exactly and, right. And I mean, you know, think about calling the radio station back then to get it on in a contest. I mean, yeah. You know, it was easy with the, the push button phone, but then when you had the rotary dial, that was a whole nother yeah. fiasco. So when yeah, did you, yeah. what did you, I guess here's my question is, so you, you went to music school. What did you do after music school that made you stay well, there? <clears throat> after, it was only a one year school. I learned a lot. And um, so when I got out, excuse me, I had a choice to make, you know, uh, uh, go back to the small town and be a big fish, good guitar player, or stay in the big town and be a small guppy. And um, I decided to stay in LA because that's where the opportunities were. Um, and uh, I had done some session work, but not big like records or anything. But so I needed to get like a, a job, like a regular job to, to like start getting, you know, getting more involved in, in opportunities in music. Um, so there was a couple older gentlemen that lived in the apartment building that I lived in. Their names were Nat and Sam. They're both from New York. And uh, they kind of took me under their wing. They're kind of, you know, they would kind of mentor me a little how to deal with things in the big city and stuff. So they were really a godsend. And uh, so they got to know me over that year. And they knew that being from Montana, I told them that I, you know, worked on, I had my friends, the Pattisons, they were farmers and ranchers. So I grew up from sixth grade on after school for about five years, hanging out with them out at their farm, learning how to drive tractors and combines and stuff like that. So they knew that I had that background. So they said, you know, a good job for you, Doug, uh, uh, now that you're looking for a job would be a, 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 be a valet parker, you know, parking cars at a hotel. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. I said, I, I would like that. And they said, yeah, and you make tips. And I'm saying, I like that idea. So, um, and I said, well, what do you guys suggest? And they said, well, you know what, why don't you start at the top, go to the Beverly Hills hotel. It's the, nice. like the, like the big best place in LA. And so I went there, I had never been there before. And when I was walking up the driveway, which is where the valet parking is, as I'm walking up the, off to the right, there was a, there was an entrance to a garage and, um, I don't know why, but it's like the fork in the road. And I thought, well, I'll go down there. And so I just walked in there. And as I walked in, there was like a limousine service uh, called Dave L. Limousine. But then farther down, there was a guy standing uh, standing at the sink. So I walked up to this guy and I said, hey, who do I talk to about getting a job here? And he said, uh, talk to me. He says, my name is John. I'm the manager of the garage. I said, oh, wow. And so, uh, so I, I, my timing was really good. He happened to be there working that day. And um and, and, and I, and he said, uh, I said, Oh, great. I said, well, I'm, I'm interested in seeing if I get a, a, a job parking cars here. And he said, and I was 19 at the time, uh, going on 20. Uh, and he said, uh, do you have a driver's license? I said, yeah, I definitely have a driver's license. And he said, can you, you know, can you drive a stick shift? It's very important in a job like this. Cause we have Ferraris and all kinds of different cars that are, you know, manual. And I said, definitely. And I said, I, you know, worked on a farm uh, for many years, uh, during my, my high school days. And, uh, I said, I could probably drive any car in here. So he kind of liked my spunk and he said, okay, he said, um, you know, when can you start? And I said, when do you want me to start? He said, how about tomorrow? So he hired me on the spot mm -hmm. and, uh, I worked with, his name was John Forrest and, and he's still a friend today. And, um, and so that was a big, that was a major, you know, what, how, what do you call it? You know, that, that, so that one, pretty. yeah, that point in your life that just puts you on the trajectory of going the way that, that, that it was good. Mm -hmm. And so getting that job there, 
was really an open door for me to uh, eventually get an uh, internship working in the music business, which I've been doing now for 30 years. But that I met a lady who was having a dinner at the Polo Lounge one night after being there a couple of years. And uh, sh- we started talking. She gave, she said she was a music publisher and I was reading a book about music publishing again, right place, right time. And she said, hey, call me. I'm looking for an intern. Um, prior to that, uh, after maybe a few months working there, there was a guy named David Tebbett, who was a, 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 a NBC executive for many years. And then at the time, uh, he actually lived in the hotel and um, he uh, he needed a driver. The driver that he had was was another valet, but he was going off to college. So John said, hey, Mr. Tebbett needs a new driver. I, I recommended you. Would you be open to it? And I said, oh, sure. What do I have to do? He says, well, you just have to drive him. He works. He's, he, he runs Carson Productions, Johnny Carson's Productions out in Toluca Lake. He said, so you, I lived in Hollywood. So you just got to pick him up Monday through Friday. You drop your car off here. He's got three different cars. He'll tell you which one he wants to drive and you just drive him over over the over into the valley and you drop them off and he only works half a day and you pick him up at one o'clock every day and bring him back to the hotel. And he said, and he pays you 500 bucks a week. And that was an 85. I thought, wow. Yeah. I said, that's I'll do it. And, and, and he said, I'll, I'll work around your shift here. He said, so you can still be a valet Parker here, but I'll, I'll put you on the night shift so you can uh, have your days free for working with him. So that was like, that was amazing because I was, you know, really young, 20 years old and I was making, really good money. But to be around a guy like David Tebbett, again, I, at the time I was so focused on music. I didn't realize, I don't think I realized what the opportunity that I had, because at the time I was driving him, <clears throat> he was 72 years old. So he was quite older than me, but he was, uh, you know, he was, uh, he's the guy that brought Johnny Carson to NBC back in 62. He was a big talents relation guy for NBC. And he brought, you know, uh, James Garner there and uh, Dean Martin. I mean, these are all his friends. And so, uh, so I drove him for about eight, eight or nine months. And I remember every morning, Monday morning, every Monday morning, he would, uh, I would take him down to, uh, uh, Santa Monica and, uh, La Cienega and he would meet, he would have breakfast, breakfast with Ed McMahon to kind of go over the week for the Carson show, you know, for the night show. And, uh, and I was always up on pop culture and people. So I, I, I knew, I knew all, who all these people were. I didn't know them, but I knew who they were. Cause I, I watched TV and read a lot and stuff. And so, um, so, and he was at the time, yeah, running Carson production. He was also the executive producer of the David Letterman show. And so I'm like his driver. I'm spending every day with him, taking him in. And he was really nice to me. Actually. Um, he knew I was a musician, so he liked jazz music. So we used to, used to listen to jazz music on the, uh, on the radio when I take him to work. And, and, um, so, but I was so focused on music, wanting to get in the music business. I wasn't thinking about being a producer in TV or movies or anything. If I had that little spark in my brain, I probably would have asked him, Hey, is it possible I get an internship, you know, at Carson productions. And, uh, but I never, I never thought of that. And I'm, I'm fine with that because things worked out the way they did. But, um, I was, you know, getting a chance to drive a very powerful, influential man in, in Hollywood. And he also used to go to parties on the weekends, uh, not all the time, but he he would uh, uh, he would give me a call sometimes. Hey, uh, uh, you have any plans Friday night? And I say, yeah, what's up? He's oh, I'm going to a party. I want you to drive me. And uh, and he would always pay me extra for that. It was never you know part of he would just. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I would I would try to make myself available. And so I would take him to these parties up in Beverly Hills and Bel Air. And uh, and a lot of times I would uh, we I didn't drive a limousine. I just drove his car, but I, I'd always be with the other limousine drivers, you know. And so I would say, hey, who are you driving tonight? Who are you driving? And he's like, oh, I'm driving Cary Grant. Oh, I'm driving uh, Dean Martin, you know, Bob Hope. And because this was 85. So a lot of these guys were still alive, you know. And so um, so I'm taking him to these parties where these guys were at. Now, I wasn't talking to those guys, but just just to be a kid from a small town in Montana to be just in that kind of inner circle, outer circle of the inner circle is pretty, was pretty cool to me. So anyway, that was a great experience working with Mr. Tebbett. Yeah. Well, a lot of people would look at that and go, wow. So you, you had a brush with the stars. Yeah, definitely had a brush. Uh, you know, I brushed them as I was opening their door and they, you know, they ran into me, you know, with their coat, but that's about it. No, but, <laughs> but, but it's a start, you know, and that was, that was really great for me because I got a little taste of what Hollywood was like in regards to, because the Beverly Hills Hotel was was literally the place. So all the the movie stars and the producers, they would come to the pole lounge to make their deals, you know, and that's been going that was going on for years. I think that place was started in 19 was built in 1912 or something long mm-hmm. time. But all through the gosh, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, that place was the place. And it was still happening in the 80s. And um, well, so and to, I was going to say real quick. Yeah. If you think about it, in the 80s, we also had the, the fashion line of the Beverly Hills Polo Lounge. 
You know, we have Beverly Hills yeah. Polo clothes. That's right. Yeah. And they had, they had the store and man, and the, that place was expensive because mm-hmm. you could like go down. There was, they had a little, di- they had a little, uh, a little cafe down, down the stairs from the lobby. And sometimes Mr. Tebbett would ask me to bring something to him. <clears throat> and sometimes I'd go there and then he'd say, Hey, sit down. And he's like, you want anything? And so sometimes I get like an orange juice and stuff. And I was looking at the menu and it's like, you know, orange juice was like, you know, $11. I mean, that was a lot of money back then, yeah. even today. But, um, but when you're living in the hotel, you know, that's, they don't really care about those prices really. Sign and, the check, sign the room yeah, and, ticket and, yeah, in his case, yeah, I just put it on my room. But he always carried a big, big wad of hundred dollar bills, real crispy bills. And he, I know that he liked that. He liked that. And when we used to go, when I take him to work uh, to Carson Productions, we'd stop at this place called Chez New. It was like a French restaurant, and we'd go in there. I'd park the car, and he didn't wait, have me wait in the car. He would say, "Come on in." So I, we'd go in and get breakfast, and he would just say, "Get whatever you want." And when, when we were done, he would just yeah, pull out a pull out a crispy hunter to just peel it off and pay for the bill. Wow. And so, but anyway, so yeah, it was neat to be around that at the Beverly Hills hotel, parking the cars, um, getting to brush with celebrities, kind of see what's going on. And then when I got the, my opportunity to be an intern with this lady, Donna, uh, I got to learn about the music business and start not just, you know, parking their cars, but I started to be friends with the producers and she also was, um, you managed Eddie Murphy and Irene Cara. I got to know Irene really well. So then I was kind of from Valet Parker to, you know, a, an associate working with them as a professional. And then as I got uh, more into the business, I started becoming, you know, I was fortunate to become friends with some pretty big movie stars just from working on projects with them and stuff. So, but that didn't happen in, you know, in a year. It, that's a, 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 t- it takes time to, to build those relationships and stuff like that. So. Well, I think that's one thing that's a misconception. Everybody thinks somebody's an overnight success when that is never the case. Unless you accidentally no. blow up on a social media app nowadays, overnight success yeah. has never been something that really has is true. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, it, it happens now, right? Because of the social media. But those people kind of peter out pretty quick. You know, they get 15 minutes of fame and then they, and then they don't know what to do after. But 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 the real way it happens. Yeah, like I think Willie Nelson. Everybody thought Willie Nelson was an overnight success. Willie, you know, worked years uh, till he became a successful performer. He was a songwriter. He actually, you know, that song called Crazy by Patsy Cline. He actually wrote that song back in the 50s, I think. But um, yeah, nobody really knew much about Willie. So, it, it, yeah, you got to put your dues in. If people think they're just going to, um, you know, grab a guitar and go sing and get get found really quick, it rarely, rarely happens like that. You got to get your stagecraft down. You got to get good in front of the mic. You got to practice, practice, practice. You got to network. You got to meet people. If you think they're going to come knock on your door at your house or something, it ain't going to happen. You got to get out there and make things happen. Yeah. You know, you can look at a story that Jerry Hall and some people will not know who Jerry Hall is, but Jerry Hall yeah, Mick used Jaggers. to be married to Mick Jagger. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, she, in her biography, she said that she was working in the Dairy Queen in Texas, and that's where she was discovered. Really? I think those days of being discovered like that are few and far between. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, and like you said, and because there's so much going on with YouTube channels and people, you know, uh, singing. Yeah, I was saying with, so with YouTube channels today, uh, people have their own YouTube channels and they're like, you know, they're singing famous songs that are on the charts, the billboard charts. So people are looking for that song and then they, and they, then they find somebody in the little thumbnail and they check them out and all of a sudden they go viral and they got, you know, 3 million views or something. Um, that didn't happen back then yet. You had to be at a soda shop or, or at uh, Rex, you know, the drug store uh, having a milkshake and some producers getting some cigarettes and sees a pretty girl. You know, that's how Lana Turner, I think got, got found. Um, uh, was it called Schwab's drugstore? It's not there anymore, but yeah, it's a, a totally different time now. Well, and, and that, you know, I, I'm an author, you're an yeah. author. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is I have set my books in 1984 and that's where it starts. And, and the fact oh. is technology is not there. So you have to craft something from what you remember. And that's the fact of there were no cell phones. Yeah. There were no, there was no social media things were still hidden. The paparazzi was bad, but the paparazzi was not as bad. Yeah. So those are, because I write rock star and Hollywood type stuff. So it's like, oh, cool. That is something that you have to play with. You have to totally. Yeah. And as the characters age and as we get older, it's a series. I hope to eventually get into the social media aspect of things, but you know, you and your book, 
you kind of went to the other side of this. You went further back, correct? Yeah, 1946, no cell phones, pay phones. <laughs> yeah, that, that was... Um, that was fun to work with that because uh, I love that era of the 40s anyway, Hollywood uh, in the 40s. But yeah, things were um, things were definitely different. Uh, I, 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 I've never been there, right? But I, I feel like it was a, a slower pace in regards to, in general, compared, compared to the way things are, are now. But I think actually things were pretty fast paced in the movie studio system. I mean, they were pumping out movies I'm right now reading a book on Louis B. Mayer and MGM getting ready for doing some research for our next book, book two. And, and uh, man, those uh, MGM was the biggest of all the movie studios and they had, they had like, you know, they had doctor's offices there. They had dentist office, just anything you needed uh, to, for them to keep their stars happy and out of trouble away from the paparazzi. I think they even had a, uh, you know, prostitutes on there. So they'd rather have the guys go there and, 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 and do their, their thing rather than being out with the girl and then get caught. And then it gets in the, in the, in the, in the, in the papers and then it ruins their career. So yeah, those things were like factories, the movie factories. And they, um, a very interesting time. Yeah, I mean, you, you had contract players and everybody had a contract. And you, even if you wanted yeah. to, to do a project with somebody else, you had to get the studio's permission. It wasn't something that was just like, oh, OK, you had. This oh, yeah. Contract. Yeah. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, OK, I'll, I'll give you Irene Dunn if you give me uh, Clark Gable or whatever. You know, yeah. they, there was a lot of wheeling dealing. Yeah, you know, in, in the movie, in my book, it deals with the movie. It's Wonderful Life. And Donna Reed, actually, uh, that was an RKO film. And Donna Reed was with MGM and she got they Frank Capra got her loaned out to do his film. But she was a contract player on MGM at MGM. Yeah, and that's, so that that's how this, the studio system used to work. It's funny because not too long ago, I had a conversation with somebody and it was regarding a, a band, a uh, band from the 80s. And somebody said to me. Well, the band would never lie about what was going on with them internally. Yeah. And I thought to myself, wow, you are pretty naive. Yeah. Because oh, there's yeah. so much behind the scenes in, in the entertainment industry that we don't know, and we don't see because they want to sell us this illusion. Yeah. And yeah. when you have the pop, you know, if we look at Britney Spears for a second, it's funny because Everybody was in the free Britney moment, but why did Britney get into that position to begin with? The paparazzi was hounding her and the fans were rabid for more information about her in her downward spiral. Yeah. So why did she end up that way? But we forget that part. Yeah. The shaved head part. Yeah. That was yeah. 10 years ago or so. Yeah. But we forget. <clears throat> it. And now, yeah. you know, it's like, Oh, free Britney. She should. Okay. <laughs> but did you help add to that? Yeah. Because in let's think about the star system for a minute. You yeah. build up people so high. Marilyn Monroe, yeah. you know, you, you will take her, for example, and then we watch them fall. And yeah. somehow we feel better about ourselves. <laughs> Why? Yeah, that's very strange. Yeah, you're rooting for them to make it to the top. And then when they fall, you're kind of rooting for them to uh, for their fall. Some people, yeah, it's kind and of sad. It, it's kind of like they don't want, they want them to have the success. But when they have the success and they start, they start dissecting it. I've seen this happen with yeah. normal people. And it's like, how, how do we function like that? And with celebrity, it's such a, a fishbowl you're living in. Yeah. Yeah. I would not want to, I I've seen it happen a lot through the years I've been here. Uh, what celebrity does to people, a lot of baggage, you know, and, and they get it, they get the money and stuff, but then they, they lose their, um, you know, this is like you and I can walk out to the grocery store and <laughs> not be seen and just have freedom, but it's hard for them to even go to the grocery store without getting hassled by somebody. And yeah. uh, that, that you're right. It's like living in a fishbowl and I don't think it's worth it, you know? And then there's always, you know, once you get in that and you start hanging around the people, there's always going to be drugs and, and alcohol and uh, overconsumption of that stuff. And then you start getting it, you know, or even just, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, Oxycontin or all that mm -hmm. stuff, you know, uh, uppers and downers and you're taking the uppers to make the downers go down. You know what I'm saying? Right. You get, hooked on all that stuff. And you're just like, how did I get here? I would never plan on doing this being like this, but it's a slow process usually. Well, and usually, you know, dare I say from what the information that I've done research on and everything, it's usually like in the music industry. Oh, I have a little blow here. Yeah, you can, it'll just make you feel a little bit better. Give your yeah. creative juices a little, you know, yeah. more fluidity. Yeah. 
And then you, oh, I don't want to do that, but okay. And then you take it and you're like, whoa, and they call it like chasing the dragon, right? How can yeah. I get that feeling again? You never get it again. And it slowly messes up. Yeah. I remember when I worked at the Beverly Hills Hotel that in the three years I was there, there was a lot of, you know, it was the 80s, right? So there was a lot of money flowing around. The economy was good. And uh, a lot of these record record executives, A&R guys, they would stay at the hotel, guys from New York. And uh, I remember sometimes they'd call down and say, hey, I need uh, I need my Chicago cassette out of my car, bring it up. So I'd get it and I'm in bungalow seven or whatever and bring it in and uh, open the door, knock on the door. Hey, come on in and, you know, go give it. And sure enough, the coffee table, big, big pile of blow, you know, doing mm-hmm. cocaine, just uh, girls get scantily dressed and, and living, you know, living the life uh, in that world. Yeah. Well, I was, I was reading an excerpt from Eddie Murphy or Eddie Murphy, Eddie Van Halen had somebody wrote a book about him briefly and they interviewed the photographer that was on the road with them during the ni- late 1970s, early eighties. Yeah. And he's like, there was a video. They actually had their manager that they ended up parting ways with because the manager had videotaped all the guys nude screwing women. Oh, wow. All these women that were scantily clad. So Van Halen fired him, then went back and the tape had gotten out, then went back and allegedly stripped everything out of their manager's office, broke in, stripped everything that said Van wow. out of their office. But wow. the, the photographer said, you know, they were they were getting so much, so many women coming after them that he, as the photographer, had three women a night. Wow. I, I mean, yeah. And it's funny because being the writer that I am, yeah, I've had this conversation where some female people that read my books are like, yeah, well, rock stars don't cheat. They don't cheat. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. Exactly. I'm like, yikes. What? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah rocks. I don't want to read a rock star where he's cheating. I I want, and it's like, are we playing Disney princesses? Because this is yeah. not the reality of Hollywood. I was just gonna say, this is not reality. Yeah. No, they, they have uh, a smorgasbord. So it's hard for them to stay faithful, even to their girlfriend or wife. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's Nate, dare I say nature of the beast. Yeah. Yeah. And as yeah. you were saying about Hollywood, I mean, we, we, they created these relationships. That was the other thing back in the old, olden days of Hollywood. They created yeah. these media relationships. I mean, look at Rock yeah. Hudson. Rock Hudson's a prime yeah. example of a lot of things closeted. And yeah, we were sold this image that Rock Hudson was this great leading man who was, you know, the wonderful, caring guy. And <clears throat> that wasn't who he was. But we painted this yeah. image and we're still being painted images even now. Yeah, going back to the Rock Hudson thing, as I told you, I'm reading this book on MGM, and it's mainly mainly about Louis B. Mayer, but and the whole studio system. And one of his uh, one of his uh, uh, actors was Van Johnson, who I've always really liked, really good, really good actor. Uh, and he was on Broadway back in the early days, and um, was a gay guy, but uh, always had him with the leading ladies in the movies. And they kind of kept that under the under the rug, you know, and. Uh, so Louis B. Mayer was always putting, you know, beautiful women in front of him, trying to keep his gayness. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And to, but but what happened is he in real life, he got into an, a car accident. Uh, I'm not sure what year, but uh, it may be in the early 40s. And he had some pretty major scars on his forehead. And they you could when you see him in the movies, you can actually see it. They put a lot of makeup on it. But when he um, was recuperating, he was really good friends with Keenan Wayne, Wayne. And I think his name was who was a, like kind of a, a, a character actor. Uh, you, you would recognize his face, but um, so he was married to his, uh, he was married and had a couple kids with his wife's name was Evie, but she kind of, they were really good friends, family friends, and she kind of helped recuperate him from being, you know, in that accident. And, and uh, Louis B. Mayer found out that he really liked her. So he had her come into his office and said, listen, you know, I got, I got a problem. I, I mean, I, I have a, th- a problem, but I think you're the solution and this could be beneficial for all of us. So he basically said, you know, um, I, I, I want you to div- you get divorced from your husband and I want you to marry Van Johnson and your husband's a B actor, but I'm going to give him a contract for the next seven years. I'm going to get him in better movies and he's going to get a weekly uh, check. I'm going to pay him well, even if any, there's any strikes, he'll still get paid and, and you and Van become married so we can, and, and, and she ended up doing it. And, and, and I just thought well, I, that was news to me. I had heard some of those stories, but I just thought, wow, that, that's the kind of power these movie moguls had. Uh, and it was all about, you know, keep keeping their stars uh, in the in the best of light, you know, to the audiences. Yeah. Now now they don't have that control. Even no. if, I, mean, I mean, if you think about it, let's, let's think about that. If you had the studio system kind of like it was back then. Yeah. 
but then you added social media that that is the wild card that is completely oh, out yeah. of control yeah they would have a tough time with that mm-hmm. yeah back then they 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 definitely they definitely had more control i think I also, uh, I didn't read this in the book, my friend Reinhardt, who wrote my book, co-wrote my book with, he was telling me uh, regarding Rock Hudson. Yeah, they, um, he, uh, his, his uh, main lover or whatever, who he's spending all the time with, they were saying, you know, so they went to, the, they sent one of their fixers from the studio. I'm not sure what studio he was with, but they sent a fixer. And uh, he basically said, uh, you know, uh, you're going to pack up today and you're going to be leaving. Here's a train ticket and you need to go back where you came from. If you don't, uh, it's not going to be good for you. And uh, they literally chased him out of town. Wow. And uh, because, you know, his career didn't need that. But once again, this goes back to, okay, so here's fame. You have fame yeah. and celebrity. What are you, what are you giving up and what are you paying to, to attain this? Everybody yeah. thinks, oh, everything will be perfect when I'm famous, but it's not. No. You, you have the same, some of them have the same exact problems we have. But sure. Magnified. Yeah. When you have a lot of money, your problems get magnified because you got so many leeches off. You don't know really who your real friends and who aren't, you know, because money does change a lot of things, your lifestyle, all the cars you get. And then uh, that's what happens. To all these guys, they, they, they get in that lifestyle and then they end up going bankrupt because they have their entourage. I mean, a good example is the guy, uh, remember what's his name? You can't touch this. Do, 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 do. MC uh, Hammer. Guy, yeah. MC Hammer. That guy was making millions and millions of dollars, but he was also spending millions and millions of dollars to where he had to go. He had to file bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. But yeah, I think you get in a bubble. What happens is you get in the, in the, in the, in the, in the fame bubble. And even you have people around you, your accounts, you know, telling you this, giving you good, wise counsel. And it's like, I don't want to hear it, you know, and, 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 and they're slowly, they're slowly going down to that point where they lose everything. And it's really sad. Well, one thing MC Hammer six, I watched his behind the music. He's like, yeah. just cause I filed bankruptcy. My bankruptcy yeah. is not like your bankruptcy and don't feel sorry for me. That's yeah. what he said. <laughs> but, but then you got to look at this. Okay. There are the people, the accountants that give wise counsel. And then there's the accountants that have hosed you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've heard those stories too. Accounts and managers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's where really people need wisdom, you know, like, like godly wisdom to make some deci- really good decisions for the people you're around because yeah, there's so many people that will take advantage of you and you think that they're your best friend and they're socking money away. That's what happened to that group bad finger. Remember? Uh, mm-hmm. I love that group. They were like the, they, they were like kind of the next Beatles. They got signed to Apple records and they had a terrible manager. This guy, his name was Stan something. And he was, he started a corporation and all the money they were making, these guys were living all together, like in a little flat with their wives in, uh, and they're making their, their company was making millions of dollars and he was getting it all. And, um, and it got to the point where Pete Ham, the lead singer was so upset. He hung himself. He literally killed himself. Wow. Yeah. And so a bad manager. Yeah. But, so you really got to be careful who you, who you uh, are handling your career and your money. But then if you look at, okay, so now we have the avenues of, yes, you can put your music out there. It's much more readily available, but if you're getting a penny a play, you're lucky. Oh yeah. That's it's, it's totally changed. I mean, it used to be, you know, you know, selling records and CDs that's gone now it's streaming, but yeah, some of these people you have to, you have to, I mean, people are getting, you know, 800 million when you're getting in, in the 500, 600, 700 million streams, you're actually starting to make money. But if you got two or three or 5 million streams, you're not making much money these days. And the way that they're making money now with the record labels, I'm not doing as much music business stuff, uh, as I've done in the past, but I still kind of keep up on some stuff, but the way they're making their money now is basically through their merchandise. If there's someone who's got, uh, are on the road and they got a following they're, they're not really making as much from the sales of their music, maybe some, but they're really making it through the merchandise. And that's, what's going on. The records are wanting the record companies and labels are wanting to do, wanting to do these 360 deals instead of just signing you. Um, they want to sign you for everything that you're involved in. And that's how they make their money because the merchandise is really the uh, one of the, and, and touring also touring slash merchandise, but, but selling and, CDs. And oh, also and- don't forget the VIP treatment. There was a recent, there's a, a group that I like that they're doing a show next year in England and they offered a VIP. Now VIP to me would be a meet and greet. 
The yeah. VIP is 500 pounds for the ticket. So we're talking over a thousand dollars. Yeah. Of money. Um, you get one signed item, you get a lanyard that gets you absolutely nowhere. Yeah. And then you get one item that you wanted signed and that's wow. it in a front row seat. And I'm like, so you're, who's making the money there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not even a meet and greet. There's no picture involved. There's nothing. So you're paying a thousand dollars for. Yeah. But, and you get enough people doing that. That's a, that's a lot. It's thousands of dollars, tens of thousands. I don't know how much, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They got to be kind of creative these days to find other ways to make money because this really has changed, you know? And, um, well, you know, a lot of people, go ahead. I was gonna say, well, a lot of people think, you know, when you get signed with the band, I've seen many, I've had friends in bands and they usually implode, you know, uh, usually because there's uh, jealousy of greed, you know, uh, usually let's say it's a four piece band and uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the bass player and the guitar player are the guys that write the songs and the drummer and the keyboard player don't, don't write the songs and uh, they get, they all get a public, you know, they get an upfront, you know, thing to sign with the, with the, with the label you know let's say they all each get fifty thousand dollars to help them live you know and then what they put their first record out and then uh and they do a video and let's say they spend a hundred thousand dollars on the video well that money has to be recouped mm -hmm. <laughs> so any any the first hundred thousand comes in doesn't go to the band it goes back to the label and uh, a lot of these bands don't realize like oh we thought we have to pay for that yeah you have to pay for it and then <clears throat> what happens is uh you know they start making they start making money from the the performance royalties and record sales and stuff and all of a sudden the, the bass player and i mean the yeah the bass player and the guitar player who wrote the song are wake are making way more money because they're you know either the publisher or the writers and the drummer and keyboard player didn't write the song so they're making way less money than the other guys and then there starts to get jealousy involved and then the bass you know then the keyboard yeah. player you know quits and goes works at a starbucks <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and I've seen that happen so many times. So my advice to people always is when they ask me, Hey, I want to get in the music business. I want to be in a band. Well, you know, what, what advice can you give me? My advice is learn how to write songs and, um, and learn an instrument and learn how to write songs. And, and, and it's called the music business. Also learn about the business side. Cause there's been so many people that, so I'll let my manager take care of that. And like you and I were talking about the manager. Yeah. He takes care of it and cleans them out. I, and also I, if you, and if you, if you also write a song and your band, let's say you have a band and you're together two or three years, you make some good money, um, two records out and you had a couple number ones, but after the band implodes and the, you know, like the guys at the at Starbucks and, um, and, and the band's not around anymore. Well, let's say somebody else takes your number one song, another band, uh, uh, you know, re-records your song and they have a number one hit with it. Well, the guy that's working at Starbucks who didn't write the song is not going to get any of that money. But the guy that wrote the song is making money from that song, even after the bands imploded. You know what I'm saying? So my advice is write songs and try to get them placed either in your own band or have other people place them because that's basically mailbox money. It's uh, it's uh, it'll keep coming to you uh, if it keeps finding a home, you know. So, yeah. Well, I had a guest um, that was on The Voice and he placed for, he was the first runner up and his coach told him you don't want to win. Because oh. then they're going to navigate your career and you're not going to be able to record what you want. Yeah. And that being said, he knew he was right because he had gone to music school and he had studied finances and business ah. and music. So he knew yeah. exactly what the coach was saying was true. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, unless you want that and you, and you want to be, you know, totally have everything taken care of for you. I mean, uh, what's her name? Kelly, uh, the one that won. Yeah, Kelly Clarkson, she's a great example where I think it worked out well for her. She, you know, they she she's she's basically done well. She had her own TV show and stuff. And um, but that doesn't happen like that. Most how many people can you count on one hand that one American Idol over the last 20 years? I mean, Kelly Clarkson, that guy, Bo. <laughs> Daughtry, but he didn't win. Adam Lambert didn't win. I yeah, mean, it's almost some like of them went on to do well without winning. You're right. But uh, it's a great platform for exposure but if you sign that deal with what's his name uh the devil <laughs> <laughs> well i wasn't going to say the devil i mean the, the british guy that always has an attitude or opinion uh, simon uh, Cowell. yeah simon now you got to give simon credit though the guy's a great businessman i mean he's he, he he's great but yeah if you sign with simon you know you're gonna make a lot of money and stuff but yeah he, he pretty much rules you uh your career so well, yeah, that, that's 
that's with any contract in, in the entertainment industry, even in a book contract. I mean, if you sign a book contract, they're going to tell you what cover you can have. They're going to tell you, well, you need to remove this out of your book. So is it worth getting that contract yeah. versus being an indie? And, and then the other thing is like you were saying about the music business. Okay. So you get that contract. They give you an advance. Yeah. Well, you may sell a bunch of books, but you know, yeah. And I, and I had an author on the show that said, you know, she was making maybe 10 cents more as a, a signed author mm. versus being an independent. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I like the indie rap better because you have 100% control. You do what you want. You don't, you do what you don't want. Uh, yeah. We are, we are so. running down on time because I know you have another interview. So let's talk about your book a little bit. Okay. Um, so yeah, the book, um, uh, the book is <clears throat> what did not start out as a book. So I've been in the, you know, the, the music uh, industry for many years, entertainment industry in general, but in 2005, I started producing uh, movies, some documentary films and, uh, always kind of wanted to do that. So when I did that, I came up with the idea at 93 and put an, wrote an outline, uh, f for a possible movie script. And then in 2002, uh, I co-wrote a script uh, called Wonderful Time. And it was the same story that the book is from. Um, basically, it's an homage to the movie. It's Wonderful Life, a time travel, historical fiction, time travel uh, film. And um, and then in 2005, uh, I got a, a big, pretty big movie producer to come on board. He read the script and really liked it. And we tried to get it made, uh, send it to a few places in town that he knew. Um, always got really good feedback on it, saying, hey, great story. Very unique. Uh, love the connection with the It's Wonderful Life movie. Uh, but it's not what we're looking for right now. So I got passes on it. Uh, so that was, um, you know, the, the history of, of how, the genesis of the book. And then about two years ago, and that was going to be maybe a 20 to $25 million film, which is a lot of money to raise as an independent film. Uh, or it could have been more if a big studio got involved. But anyway, so two years ago, I've been learning more about, you know, I did manage a voice actor for a while. So she had done some narration and things. So I was kind of learning the voice acting world, managing her. And, and then I just kind of thought, wow, you know what? I, uh, the books are doing really well. Audio books, it's a big, bigger, big, growing bigger and bigger. And I thought maybe I can take that movie script and uh, make it into a novel. The stories are there, but I just have to, it was like 120 page, you know, 12 font, 125 page word document, which, you know, in movies, it's like a page is about a minute. So it's like a two hour movie. So, but to make it into a novel, I did the research and for, for historical fiction, you know, the, the word count is about 80 to 90,000 words which that's not how I would think. So um, I brought in a, 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 a co-writer and we uh, ended up writing it um, and uh, came in about 85,000 words. Nice. And so, so, but I just realized why well, I could do that a lot less expensive than trying to raise, you know, $20 million. That's a lot of money to raise. Uh, so that's, that's the route I took. And I'm really glad I took it. it, it I, I came up with the idea two years ago, the guy that wrote the script with me, George, he was the first guy I brought on to co-write it with me because we had written the script together. And, um, and he'd written some books before, but it wasn't quite getting it for the book. So uh, about a year ago, I decided and we're still friends, but I just say, hey, listen, it's not working out. And um, and I didn't want to write, write the book by myself because I, I'm like a quasi author. It's not something I ever wanted to do, but I, I, I wanted to do it because I wanted to get the yeah. take the script. But I really wanted somebody who had more more of a seasoned writer. And, and so I got Reinhardt who, who had read a couple of his scripts. We've been friends for about three or four years and his scripts were excellent. You know, I've read a lot of scripts through the years. So I knew I know what's crappy and what's good. His dialogue was great. And he actually read my time travel script when we first met. So I called him up and said, Hey, listen, I, you remember my time travel script? I see, I make it into a book. My first author, a co-author just wasn't getting it. I said, you want to be my partner and, and co-write it. And I said, I'll even make you a partner in the whole series. It's going to be a series of books, Hollywood time travel series. And so he loved the idea. So we came on board and, uh, and we, we started that in January of this year, actually. And we finished it in June and then uh, got it uh, out, uh, made available on October, uh, like the middle of October on Amazon. And now it's on, um, uh, you know, uh, Barnes and Noble, but boy, did I learn a lot in the last two years? I mean, uh, this was all, uh, you know, I'm a music publisher, which is getting songs in movies and TV shows. It's, it has the word publishing in it, but it has nothing to do with book publishing. Very, very different. So I had to, had a big learning curve, um, of learning the business side of it. You know, once, once I tell people, once the writing's done, that's just the start. That's phase one. Now you got to get a copy editor, yeah. you know, a proofreader, a, a book and diner, a designer, illustrator, get your book cover done, 
uh, just a lot of a lot of work. I ended up hiring a book coach. Uh, who is a book coach slash marketing consultant. Cause I really want to, I always try to surround myself with really talented people so I could have a great project. And so she was really helpful with me, uh, kind of holding my hand and tell me what to do, what not to do. Um, so I learned a lot from her and, um, yeah. So that's kind of the history of it. So hollywoodtimetravel.com is the website. Uh, the name of the book is it's a wonderful time. And the way, the best way to describe the book is back to the future meets midnight in Paris on the set of it's a wonderful life. And it starts off in 2021 guy goes back through a time warp and he ends up in 1946 Hollywood in the summer, April, actually, which is the, the months that they made uh, April to July, the months that they made produced it's a wonderful life. And he meets Jimmy Stewart. He actually works on the film as an assistant editor. And it's a, it's a great little kind of fun romp back to post, you know, world war II Hollywood. Nice. Nice. So that's, uh, that, that's kind of the background of that. I was going to tell you, you know, now the 1980s are considered historical fiction. I know. I mean, that was, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, 45 years ago or so. I mean, that's crazy. I know. And I, cause that's where I write. And it's like, when the, cause I've been working on this for a few years. And it's like, and when the time clicked over, I was like, wow. So now I'm writing historical fiction. How did I get here? Yeah. Th that's amazing to think the 80s is historical fiction, but it really is. Yeah. 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 So, and, and the other thing about, you know, you doing this project, there is the possibility if you find enough ground and enough following, yeah, that you can still get it turned into a movie and you have the script already done. Well, that's true. Yeah. So I'm kind of going the, the opposite. Usually, you know, you write a book and you hope it gets made into a movie and a script made, but mine actually started off as a movie script. And I've kind of moved on from the script. That's the thing is like, you know, I, I put a, I put time in it and it just didn't happen. So uh, I'm glad I got the idea to do it into a book. And then the funny thing is, is after I did it into a book, um, uh, getting it out there and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that knows, as you probably know, this is a, a, putting books out and writing was a marathon. You don't, you're not going to see instant gratification. I'm, I'm going to be marketing this book all through next year and the years to come. And then, so it's a nonstop process, but um uh, I, I think that if, if it catches on, I think it, the, uh, the books could be good for, um, for a TV series. Cause you know, I've been, uh, I watched that one on Hulu about, uh, uh, with James Franco, it was from a Steven Spielberg, uh, Steven, oh, not, that, not Steven Spielberg, Stephen King book about 11, 23, 63, about, uh, when JFK got killed. And I watched that and I really enjoyed it. And, and that was a book. Uh, that was a, a, uh, like a limited series, like maybe five or six or seven episodes just from that one book. And so that's being done now. You know, these streaming sites do have a lot of money. Uh, well, they're actually sites, but they're actually studios. It's the streaming studios, Hulu, App, Apple, uh, Amazon and Netflix. You know, they're looking for content. So since mine deals with Hollywood, that could happen. Um, but I, I'm kind of people are saying, why don't you get in touch with them? I'm thinking to myself, well, I'd like to maybe get two or three books underneath my belt and get the concept going then, then to get a deal and then be pressured to have to be pumping these things out. Cause I know, as you know, some authors are writing four or five books a year. I don't even know how they, I wouldn't even want to think about that. That's just too much for me. So I, I'm a little more, um, you know, maybe every year and a half get a book done because I'm doing other things than just doing right. the book thing, uh, which I'm enjoying though. I've learned a lot and I, I'm enjoying it and I've gotten really good feedback so far from the book. So, I think it might get a falling, but we'll have to see, you know, all you can do is try, right? That's all you can do. And then just keep marketing and keep yeah. going. And, you know, you, you have to, you have to do what's right by you and by your, yeah. Book. So right now I'm trying to learn, um, Amazon ads, you know, that's the next stage. So there's a guy named, uh, Dave Chasen who has a thing called Kindlepreneur. So I've been watching a lot of his videos and, uh, rocket publishing. So, I'm, I'm, it's such a learning curve. So I have to literally spend hours watching that. So I can figure that out, but that's kind of my next phase for the marketing aspect. So, well, and the keyword thing is a whole nother that's yeah weird thing because people will move the keyword. It's just, yeah, there's so much to learn. And, and like you said, you think, okay, I wrote a book. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. I told, I, I told my friend who's writing the book and he's been kind of watching me and I, and I said, listen, you got to understand that here's the reality check. Once you write the book and you have your hundred friends, uh, uh, go. And uh, I said, you tell, ask a hundred friends to buy it. I said, all hundred are not going to buy it. You might get 20 or 30 if you're lucky. And then you, and then you ask them to write a review. You might get 10 or 15 to write a review. And then 
you have to be careful that Amazon doesn't see that you, this is your yes. friend because then they'll take your review down. Totally. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. And, and then, but then after you go through that hundred or 200 people, then what? Yeah. And, and then I, that's what I said, you know, and I'm spending money on marketing and doing, um, you know, discount things on um, not book, but yet, but I'm going to do book, but I got to reach, I think 30 reviews. I think I'm at 25 or 26 reviews. So I'm getting close, but you know, red Robin reads and things like that. And those do help. I'm learning about that. You know, you, you spend 20 to $30 and you get a bump of like 60 eBooks, you know, sold, you bring the mm -hmm. price down to 90 cents. Um, but yeah, after your friends buy it, it's like, then what? And you got to ask that question because you got to be ready. Uh, because after that, I, I tell my friend, there's millions of books, millions of books to pick from. How are you going to get exposure for yours and, and pick yours over theirs, uh, the, the ones out there, you know? Well, and I have to say this real quick, you know, yeah. when there's, when you're competing against books like dinosaur porn, yeah, yes, somebody wrote a, a, like, I think a 25 page book, if it's even that thick, selling wow. it for two ninety nine dollars about dinosaur porn. Wow. That's very interesting. <laughs> The only reason I know this, it was in an author group I belong to. And I'm like, this wow. has to be a joke. No, it's real. It really wow. is. Wow. So that's what you, when you say there's millions of books out there, well, yeah. there are, and they're about anything and everything. Yeah. And everybody's trying to get their attention, get those readers' attention. Mm -hmm. And some of them have big budgets to pay for marketing, and some don't. So, exactly. Yeah. So your yeah. website is hollywoodtimetravel.com. Yes, that's correct. Yep. And is there anything else that we need to add before you go? Because I know no, just uh, on the website, you can see the synopsis. There's a book trailer on there, author bios, me and right, my, mine and Reinhardt's bios, just all the kind of stuff you need to know about the book. Uh, there's places to click, which will take you to Amazon to get it. And um, yeah, other than that, uh, appreciate you taking the time to have me on uh, for the invite. And uh, it's been a good conversation. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you I wish you the best on your books too. Yeah. So Doug, you know, there was some fascinating stories in, yes, Hollywood in the 1980s. So I, I think that that's an honest conversation and Doug and I have talked and he will come back because he has some more stories to tell. So I will be looking forward to that and I hope you do as well. If you enjoyed the show, please reach out, leave a review on Podchaser or applepodcast.com. We also, as you know, have all of our episodes on the better2podcast.com website. So you can catch up on any episodes you may have missed. All of our social links are there as well. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns about this episode or the show itself, and you might want to be a guest, you can contact me at Donna, D-A-U-N-A, at better2podcast.com. That's Donna at better2podcast.com. As always, I thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed the show and I'll catch you next time. Bye guys. You're listening to the Better 2 Podcast with DM Needham. Mm -hmm.